everybody. My name is Mark. I trained as a physician, also studied health policy and math, and I'm at the Duke Institute for Health Innovation. And I'm Joe. I'm a postdoc at Harvard, working in the intersection of machine learning and health. And hi, I'm Madeline Claire Ellish. I'm an anthropologist working at Data and Society. Oh, clicker. We will, we will use the clicker. Yes, and so we're really, really excited to talk to you today um, about a use a uh, case study of sepsis watch. And this was truly an interdisciplinary project, as you can tell. Um, I was really excited as an anthropologist to go hang out in an ER, because I thought it might look like that. Obviously, it doesn't. Um, uh, but I was really excited as an anthropologist to get to see what were how were um, issues of accountability, transparency, fairness being grappled with in actual practice. And so as a grad student in machine learning at the time at Duke, it was really exciting to be able to work on a technical problem that actually would have tangible impacts in the real world on patients at the end of the day. And it was also really eye-opening to see like, what a small part my work was in this much broader socio-technical system and like, appreciating how challenging it actually is to integrate this type of new technology into a real clinical use case. For me, what was most exciting was the scale and the speed that we would be able to show an impact. So sepsis happens 20 times a day in our hospital and progresses on the course of hours. So if this was successful, we could show that at a much quicker pace than some, some other domain. So sepsis, it's a silent killer. This is actually the number one cause of mortality in hospitals in the United States, and globally 20% of all deaths are attributable to sepsis. So in our setting at Duke, Duke University Hospital, 55% of sepsis cases occur within 12 hours of presenting to the emergency department, and there's a 10% mortality. So as I mentioned, about 20 cases a day, about two deaths a day. So sepsis, despite being such a global problem, is not very well understood. So these are two visual aids from two top-notch publications from the, the premier researchers in sepsis. So visual aids to help you understand what sepsis is. So on the left-hand side, you see that it is some combination of infection and organ dysfunction, where there's not clear boundaries between these things. And then three years later, on the right-hand side, we see four subtypes of sepsis named after Greek alphabet letters and a much higher dimensional relationships between all the organ systems. So sepsis is a black box. We diagnose it, but there's no clear cut definition. So the challenge was that this label does not have agreement from, from experts within the field, but there is a sense of urgency because it is such a huge cause of morbidity and mortality. And for us to be able to implement something, we needed to be able to, to gather trust and accountability at scale. So we run three hospitals, about 2,000 beds, and I just looked it up, it's about 11,000 clinical staff. So given these circumstances, the question we, we grappled with, what were the best strategies to build trust and accountability with whatever we were gonna build? Um, right, because put another way, and we are on the explainability panel, there was not an explainable solution here because <coughs> sepsis itself is not explainable. And so we were interested given a good, you know, is, is explainability necessary if we have values we want to uphold like uh, trust with clinicians or accountability, both formal and informal mechanisms. And so part of our um, uh, research collaboration was um, the team who developed the tool, implementing, integrating, and then also um, sort of reflecting and studying. Uh, we obviously cannot cover everything in this presentation, so you should go read the paper. And in fact, you can see this very large and complex table we're not gonna be able to talk through all of it. What we'll do for the rest of the presentation is talk through a few examples. Um, because what we ended up um, getting to was, first of all, we looked at strategies to build trust and accountability across the timeline of the project. Really often, I feel like in this community, we're really focusing on these sort of first two columns. Um, but there's these, the rest of tool design development, workflow development, integration, education, and handoff and maintenance, which has already come up this morning. Um, and we uh, also identified four major sort of themes or buckets of strategies. Um, one around problem formulation. What, what is the actual problem that we're trying to solve? And if we get that problem really right, can we get uh, toward, toward values of um, uh, trust and, and accountability? And also a huge focus on stakeholder relationship building. 
um, and also feedback loops. And we looked at these at two different things because one is about stakeholder mapping and engaging and the other is about sustained feedback. Um, and then finally, something uh, that we will only touch on briefly, and there will be other research projects around, is um, around upholding professional discretion and uh, autonomy, and how that's actually really also key to um, getting where we want to go. So I, I love the positionality tutorial yesterday. There is no view from nowhere. So despite the confusion around sepsis, we had to choose a sepsis definition. So we got consensus from our clinicians. This entire project was built off of locally curated data from our hospital over three years of data. We created partnerships, multi-stakeholders, so operations leaders, clinical leaders, hospital leaders, and this was a group that we worked with over three years. And this wasn't just a technical problem of identifying sepsis, but it was a workflow problem. So our frontline staff in the emergency department were already overwhelmed with alerts, and there's a classic phrase in healthcare called alarm fatigue. So we had to create a new role to use the technology to support our frontline clinicians. This is what the production user interface looks like. So a lot of the emphasis of the tool is not just on detection and triaging on the left-hand side, but it's on the management of the condition. Because once, the, once sepsis is diagnosed, there are standard guideline recommended therapies for treating sepsis. So I want to make it clear, this is something that is now somebody's job. There is someone in Durham, North Carolina using this 24 hours a day, seven days a week since November 2018. So it was my job as the grad student on the project to build the underlying uh, machine learning model to tackle the very narrow sub-problem of actually identifying sepsis early. So what the approach I ended up using combined um, a type of probabilistic model from machine learning called Gaussian processes, which are great for things like clinical time series, with a downstream black box, in this case, deep learning system. And so it was surprising to me at first that there really wasn't pushback from the, the frontline clinicians involved in the project to build something more directly interpretable or white box. And as Mark mentioned earlier, a lot of that was the fact that sepsis as a label wasn't really well understood in the first place, and so they weren't really pushing for something they could explain. Um, and so also, as you saw in the previous slide, there are, in, in those different kind of panes that show the, the dashboard application, the model was solely being used to rank order, the order in which people appear on that dashboard, but then there's actually a human that's going through and screening and saying, yes, treat this person, no, don't treat this person. In this case, even our definition is a false positive, say. Um, and so even though the risk predictions from the model itself weren't directly explainable, there was some context as, as far as other variables being shown, and then even the frontline uh, users actually using the application do have direct access to the health record. So if they're curious, they can pull up and see the full context for what this patient looks like at this point in time and decide, do we or do we not want to start treatment? And so after building this, you know, we wrote a couple of cool machine learning papers. I figured, great, we'll be able to just plug this right into the IT pipeline, right? Very quickly realized that it is a really complicated um, technological infrastructure involved in the back end of how a hospital operates, right? So we were one very small piece of this much broader pipeline that runs from raw data being processed in the live production electronic health record all the way down to downstream at the, at the other end, the front end user interface that the, the actual clinical users were using that served both you know, the model's predictions along with other variables and um, the full UI interface. Um, and so, as Joe mentioned, there, um, as a socio-technical system, this wasn't just about um, a tool on an iPad, it was about the person using the tool in um, part of an existing cl clinical workflow. Um, so this is a quote that actually comes from one of our interviewees, which really talks about how uh, using this tool became a new source of expertise and, in fact, um, a new source of actually professional pride for some of these nurses. Um, and I think that's a really exciting opportunity um, to think about the future of work. Uh, there's also, um, uh, in practice, the team developed a model card. Um, and also, uh, at another point in the development, um, there was a multi-stakeholder governance committee that was established that included uh, both patient representatives, frontline clinicians, as well as the tech team and the um, hospital management. Um, but something which was also interesting is even as responsibility was sort of distributed, uh, it also remained firmly planted with the tech team. Uh, so something that Mark likes to say a lot is you build it, you own it. And so even though the sort of development ended up, yeah, he's standing, all right, I'm going to, yeah. um, uh, even though the development um, sort of, it moved into the ER, they still kept uh, actually physical eye on what was happening. 
If you want to read more, come uh, read the paper or come find us uh, during the conference. Thank you.